folks, for stopping by this afternoon. Uh, this is actually my first time to Singapore. It's a beautiful country. I'm from Texas, so it's quite a long way from home. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you making the stop. So you know, the topic today, I'm just going to cut to the finish, and then we'll go through the whole logic behind the finish. The answer is know what you're hunting for. You know, people talk about the mechanics of hunting and the tools and the techniques and all those things, but, but really you have to understand what is it you're up against and how you use that knowledge to proactively hunt what's really important to the firm. So we're going to talk about the threat environment we're operating in today and how much it's changed. Uh, so when you think about threats of today versus threats of even five years ago, meaningfully different landscape. So let's think about consequences. So the influence elections campaigns we saw, you know, by Russia against the U.S. primarily, but you also saw it against Myanmar and Hong Kong, France, lots of elections have been tampered with in one way, shape, or form. The consequences that are significant and the threat activity by countries against other countries and their willingness to test the limits of what norms are, it's really beginning to change the threat landscape that we operate in. So moving forward, you think about a country now targeting a bank to steal money to fund weapons programs. That's unheard of. These are unprecedented types of things we're seeing and changes in the threat environment that we operate today in. And the consequences on each of our respective businesses and governments are a lot different than they used to be. When you think of just cyber crime and credit card theft and PII and maybe some slight disruptive attacks. So then you move into what had been typically off limits. You know, a country turning off the lights in another country. In terms of the operational norms that we operate in, you typically think there's certain things that are sacred. I mean, don't tamper with financial systems, healthcare systems, you know, certainly not the grid to operate, you know, the energy in a certain part of the country. So we've seen Russia with Estonia and now with Ukraine um, on repeatable attempts and actually successful efforts in trying to go out and actually affect consequences through cyber means in other countries. Again, unprecedented, haven't seen this a lot historically. Then you move on, I think is really comical. So you've got in these types of events through like ransomware, through WannaCry, and then Petya, which is not Petya, capability that was supposedly leaked from intelligence communities in the West in the hands of shadow brokers that are selling subscriptions to these cyber weapons. And they're indiscriminate sellers. You can buy it if you're a terrorist group, you can buy it if you're a criminal group, you can buy it if you're another country. So you've got now weapons-grade capability that are leaking out into the public domain, which is beginning to really shift the battlefield when you think of what's motivation, intent, and capability. Capability is out there in the merchandise, and you can pick it up and link it to that motivation, intent, and capability. Again, changes landscape. This, I thought, was comical because it really put the core ransomware operators at risk. You know, the Petya folks that were actually ransomware operators, when you have Russia targeting Ukraine using what looked like a Petya variant, it was really destructive malware. And what that did is it gave trust issues for the traditional ransomware operators. Because you couldn't, there's no payment mechanism to actually pay the ransom um, and release your data. They just went in and overwrote the master boot record and destroyed data. So destructive malware. Originally thought to be targeting just Ukraine, and it propagated inside the local you know, uh, network versus the, over the public internet, but it propagated in 62 countries. Again, consequences going up, facilitated by leak of tools, merchandising and marketing of capability, stakes are getting higher. So let's think about us as defenders, what kind of operational environment we live in today. It seems calm. We're about 400 kilometers from the equator. But right now, as we sit here comfortable in these chairs, the Earth is spinning 1,000 miles around its axis, 1,000 miles an hour around its axis. We're rotating 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. And we're all here trying to figure out how inside of that balance, we're able to go execute a security program that can operate in this incredibly changing climate we live in, you know, called the cyber threat environment. In that, if you launch a missile to the moon today and you're off by 1%, you're 4,000 miles away from your target. So when you have the world changing very fast, all of the threats that are evolving around us, it requires us to have an adaptive posture. You can no longer say, here's a great program, I comply with these regulations, it's SANS top 20, it's NIST guidelines, it meets all my peer groups, you know, thumbs up for being what's resilient, and what's reflective of great, best in class security today. You have to constantly question your security discipline to know that the threat environment is changing and it renders your current controls effective or ineffective every day. 
So constantly understanding the threat environment you're operating in is going to change your behavior, and you have to accept that change is a constant in the threat environment, and therefore change must be a constant in your security environment, the way you protect against those threats. So let's talk a little bit about the traditional SOC orientation today and how most people spend their time. So from studies we've seen uh, and actually conducted, about 95% of the time that SOCs spend their time, it is not proactive, purposefully hunting to find any kind of residual effect or any kind of lingering effect of adversaries in your environment through hunting. The vast majority of time is spent, in fact, enriching and validating the data, ticketing and reporting, notifications and escalation, a lot of repeatable, meaningful tasks. So we find ourselves with such limited resources in this industry using those limited resources in ways that can be automated. So you start to think of what am I doing every day, how much of that can be automated, and how can I shift my time from what is remedial and automatable into something that's really important, driven through intelligence, and has real value to your company on the hunting side. So what's the future SOC? It's no longer reactive. It's proactive and efficient. How do I streamline and automate all those repeatable tasks? How do I accelerate my response time? How do I detect anywhere but hunt everywhere? How do I eliminate those swivel chair investigations where I'm going from system to system to system, trying to find out and understand what's happening, and then go enter data and kick off tickets and all these other systems? Very, very sloppy the way we do business today. And then finally, how do I free up my time, my limited, talented resources, to focus on what's the most important risk to my business and go proactively hunt and eliminate it from my environment? How you do this requires intelligence to be at the core of every foundational decision you make, both strategically and tactically. Like I said at the beginning, the secret of hunting is knowing what to hunt for. Just don't go hunt for everything. It's just like security. The security practitioner says, I'm going to protect against every possible threat to my environment. You're, in essence, going to protect nothing. There's so many ways in through IoT and bring your own device and all the connectivity we have through vendors and contractors. There's no way you can protect against everything. You have to have a clear understanding of what you're up against, how those threats get executed, what the impacts over those threats are, and then how you build your programs to protect yourself. So intelligence, foundationally, drives all operations of military doctrine. There is no conflict that you will see anywhere in the world where there isn't some intelligence capability it's saying, what are we up against? How do they operate? What are their resources? What are their strategies? And use that to inform how you're going to defend in that conflict. Same thing in sports. I mean, the folks that tend to do the best in sports, they watch the most film of their components. They know what they do in certain game situations. They know that at certain times and certain po points in the game, they've got talent that they're going to apply in a certain way to try to defeat your defenses. So studying the film and understanding how your opponents operate, really insightful, and it drives really effective sports outcomes and competitions. Business. You'd never think of launching a new business or a new product in a country unless you settle the geopolitical environment, the tax environment, the competitive environment, all the things that relate to business success so you can compete effectively in that business. Yet if you think of benchmarking in cyberspace, so many times we benchmarked ourselves against regulation and compliance or a peer group when, in fact, we should be benchmarking ourselves against the adversary. So how do you understand those threats and use that as your gold standard to understand how your current defenses help you counter those threats effectively over time. So the simple kind of five-step plan, right, to go in and achieve Intel-led security for your program. The first piece of it is understand what are the core threats that create the biggest risk to your business. Separate the, the noise from the signals. And this is a business exercise. This isn't a machine exercise. It is really understanding what are those threats that are real threats that are active today in the world, not hypothetical threats, that if successfully were executed against your business would create the most significant consequences. What creates a $4 billion move in market cap like we've seen recently in the US? You know, what creates real economic value, real brand value, real damage and consequence to your operational footprint? So you build out that threat profile. Then you understand what your countermeasures are against those threats, specifically mapping. Threat A, 
This group's going to go try to compromise this environment. They're going to destroy our data, manipulate other data, and then they're going to leak all that data in the public, and they're going to go spoof my CEO's email to have him make a false statement about it. That's a strategy that someone's going to use. Now, how do they execute it? Intelligence is decision advantage over the adversary. That's fundamentally what intelligence implies. So to do that, it's not just the who and the what and the why, it's the how. How are they actually executing? What are their TTPs? So when you now understand the how, the offensive playbooks, then you can really look at the defensive playbooks you need to implement to counter that how. Right? So you got the threat broken down to the TTPs, you got your offensive playbooks, now you can say, now I can defend against that. Part of that playbook development defensively is how you proactively hunt and remediate. So you have to have your sensing infrastructure tuned to try to find things that don't look right in your environment. You then figure out where the signals are in the noise. Then you need intelligence to pivot into what am I up against? Okay, this piece of malware that's coming from this C2 has these registry keys in the payload. That is this group using this playbook to try to accomplish this objective. And that's on my risk register. That's a top risk for my particular concerns. So now that I know what I'm up against, again, leveraging intelligence, now I can say, all right, now I can proactively pivot off that information. And how do I go hunt knowing everything I can about that adversary, loading up all of their machine readable indicators into my hunting infrastructure and proactively remediate for my environment? Detect anywhere in your sensing infrastructure, but remediate everywhere through proactive hunting. That should not be 5% of your time. That should be 95% of your time. The other 95% can get automated. The investment strategy is really core to my background. So I'm a finance and economics guy by background. Start off on Wall Street, manage money for a living. And I looked at financial risk and market risk. Now I look at cyber risk. So when I think about risk efficiency, and this is a financial conferences, and if you want to be a security professional that is business relevant to your enterprise, you need to, with confidence, talk to your executive team and your board and say, I am an effective manager of risk for our company because I manage more risk per dollar of investment than any of my peers. Risk efficiency. So how do you buy down the most risk per dollar of investment? That's really understanding what the consequences are of those threats and what's the most cost-effective way to buy down the likelihood of that particular threat being executed against me? It starts with a precise understanding of the threats that are relevant, a precise and realistic understanding of whether your current countermeasures and controls are effective against those threats, and an ability to work with your business executives to say, hey, if this is successfully executed against us, what are the real consequences? What does that mean? So if we had a breach of this magnitude, what does that mean to our business, to our brand, to our customers, to our trust we established over time? So that drives an investment curve I'll get here in a minute. And then you implement intel security, which is effectively how strategically I constantly evaluate all of my security investments against the threat environment currently and as it changes. Tactically, how I'm, in, I'm using intelligence and analytics to find those threats that hit my threat register. So these are a top threat to my organization use that to turn around and operationally hunt and remediate for those threats in my environment. So you think about value at risk and likelihood of being expressed. All right, this, is an, this is an expert system. We are asked to be experts and our judgment matters. So many times great is, is at the death you know, of just being good because if, if customer says, what's the probability of being tacked today? you know, from, a, from a, their executives, and they say, oh, 32.6%, they will get blown up. If you say, a heck of a lot higher than it was yesterday, because we're an e-tailer, we've got DDoS mitigation up to 100 gig, and we've seen an adversary that's targeted us before testing 200 gig capability in this underground forum. Probability's gone up significantly. What's the consequence? You know, I went to the marketing team, and they said, that's going to be a million dollars a minute. So the probability of a million dollar a minute event has just gone up significantly. I think we should invest in enhanced DDoS mitigation. An example of using intelligence to drive your operational footprint and leverage that to make solid investment decisions. That drives risk efficiency. Then the precision of evaluating your security programs against your threat profile 
really drives and affects this, this risk efficiency as an overall program. What are the core threats to my environment? Enumerate them. Top 10, top 20, top 30, shouldn't be a top 100. Right? Enumerate what those threats, threat scenarios. Then look at your current countermeasure program. Say, OK, the way they execute this, it's a spear phishing attack. They execute and establish a foothold. Here's how they hide and beat all your forensics capability. Here's how they move laterally, escalate privileges. Here's how they gain access to sensitive data in the reconnaissance effort. Here's how they slip data out and defeat traditional DLP systems. Here's how they operate, the mechanics of their actual attack playbook. When you have the mechanics and the understanding at that level of granularity, you can be really precise in testing your countermeasure and your controls to say, could we actually detect this if it was in play against us? And if the answer is no, and that's a super high value at risk threat, then you really need to consider investing in that area. But it's this mapping of threats and countermeasure programs that enables that efficiency of investment and spend to allow you to, in good faith, talk with your executives and your board and say, I am a risk-efficient manager for the organization. We've been in a global economic upswing for quite a while. That will change at some point. When it does, the efficiency by which you deploy your security investments will be paramount to your success as a security officer. Because we can't just buy more things and expect that to help out. So how do you manage more risk per dollar investment is really going to be the driver. So it really plays out, and I call it a risk curve. How much money are you investing? What's your risk buy down? So think of risk back there as probability of that likelihood, probability of that outcome, that value of risk of happening. In a compliance-based program, regulations are born out of common threats to a particular sector. What are the threats to the financial sector? That starting point treats all financial sectors the same, whether you're an investment bank or a merchant bank or a retail bank or an online bank or a credit card processor you're regulated by the same body. And they have a certain set of controls. It's directionally correct. So you'll be buying down risk with each one of those controls you implement. In an Intel-led security program, the way we looked at it prior, how you look at the overall threat environment that you operate in, prioritize all your countermeasures based on the value at risk of each of those threats, allows you to significantly improve the risk efficiency of a program and buy down more risk per dollar. So in this scenario, you're simply managing more risk per dollar by being more precise with your spend. Moving into the summary here of how this all brings to life what we do every day. Hunting, in and of itself, is futile if you don't know what you're hunting for. So you can have the greatest tools, the greatest technology, the greatest team, without a clear understanding of what's relevant to your organization you might be hunting and remediating things that are trivial, have very little consequence to the organization, and are never really going to make the day in terms of knowing that you invested in a manner that helped protect your business in a cost-effective way. So the same problem we deal with every day exists in every one of our organizations. There's no way that we can scale our resources to the size of the problem we're up against. You know, I was on a panel a couple years ago with the CISO of a large government agency, and somebody asked in the, in the audience, they said, boy, you must have a tremendous volume of alerts you have to deal with. He said, oh, yeah, about a billion and a half a day. I said, ooh, a billion and a half. I said, well, how do you deal with that? Well, I've got excellent people process technology I apply to that alert volume. I can shrink it to about 1,000 critical alerts a day. I said, wow, you must have a huge team. I said, I've got a great team. I'm really proud of them. I've got well-resourced, I've got good support. I can handle about 10 a day. So nobody asked him the next logical question. I did. And I sat next to him and I said, hey, Kevin, which 10? Right? you got a 99% chance of being wrong. Which are the 10 that present the biggest risk to your business? He said, oh, yeah. All I do is I take those 10, I hit our intelligence repository, I pull through the matches, I read the executive summary, say, which of these reflect the biggest risk to our organization at this point in time? Uses that to kick off their prioritization. Right? That's a man in the middle. It's an expert system. Um, you can't automate that. That's the judgment of really knowing what's important to your respective business or enterprise. But that example gives you an idea of risk efficiency in a tactical manner. 
So when you start saying, how are we going to spend our resources? If you can automate repeatable tasks, you free up your time for more hunting assets. If you're able to gain sensor access and visibility in your environment, apply solid intelligence analytics, you can find out those threats that are really important. Once you understand, now I've got a threat that's important, which can only be defined if you understand the who, what, why, how, and when. Who's up, who am I up against and how are they executing? Now you can pivot into a proactive, offensive mindset and say, I'm going to remediate this actor. There are people behind keyboards. How am I going to go employ my defensive capability and remove this actor from my environment and increase my guard because I, now I know what I'm up against. The other thing it enables is rather than the quarterly meeting and say, how did you guys do this quarter in security? Oh, I blocked 46 million malware infections. Executive suite scratches their head. They don't know what that means. If you say, well, you know, one of our top 10 risks on our risk register executed against us this quarter because the investments you gave us in these security controls and technology and people and intelligence, we're able to detect them and defeat them in a matter of two days. Wow. What was, a, what was the consequence associated with that? Well, we got on our risk register about a $100 million event. What did all that cost in your people process technology intel? About $4 million. Spent $4 million, boarded $100 million, see you next quarter. That security officer is business relevant. So when you think of how you are business relevant in your environment and how you're efficient in the way you help manage risk for your enterprise, it's really about those wins that relate on finding evil in your environment that is a real relevant threat that you could put some semblance of consequence. What would this mean if this was successfully executed against us? And you can use that knowledge to pivot into action and go proactively remediate it from your environment. And now have that on your clear dashboard. This is active threat against us. It's likely they're not going to go away. They're just going to go another way. Because you're a victim of choice, not a victim of chance, if it's one of those top threats. And you need to continuously think about changing your behaviors as that adversary changes theirs. So thanks for your time. I'm a couple minutes ahead of schedule, and I'm going to give them back to the audience. So thank you.